Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm actually, I'm not a techie. I'm a political scientist and I study security policy, defense related issues for about 35 years. And my role is to look into the future a little bit and to see what the future security challenges are because the better we understand them, the better we understand customer requirements in the future. So that's a little bit the idea. And uh, doing that, of course, you discover usually old things and new things, things you have seen for centuries or millenniums even, and other things that are new. So I try to put artificial intelligence a little bit into context. History always is um, continuity and change. So in a sense, many of the future wars we're gonna see and uh, challenges we know pretty well um, from the Roman times. In a sense, we are Roman Empire plus cyber, right? Things that are old, things that are new. So, of course, sometimes um, new stuff replaces the old one. Um, we have very little cavalry today, um, although horses could be useful in some areas in Afghanistan, actually. But when we invented long-range weaponry like bow and arrow, it was superior to the club, but only as long as the archer didn't come within striking distance of the club, then he had a problem. So we're gonna see in the future laser weapons, cyber war, everything, but also explosives, guns, and all that thing. Trend extrapolation usually means it's about higher, faster, further, but sometimes there's something new. When Henry Ford um, made this wonderful statement about the cars, he's saying, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So sometimes we have to explain why well, we invented the combustion engine and things are going to change, and the big changes that we are going to face are nanotechnology, biotechnology, robotics, and artificial intelligence. And the interesting thing comes up if these four megatrends merge. Well, we had a chemical evolution, if you wish, a biological, perhaps one day we have a mental evolution. Actually, I can't wait this to happen. If you watch TV in the afternoon and you zap through the channels and you see these soap operas and soul strip these shows and whatever, I physically suffer after five minutes. I find it so unbearable. But this is homo sapiens, is it or is it not? Is this really the result of evolution so far? Or can we move a little bit beyond that? Um, so, so let's see. Um, we are at the edge of completely going into the digital um, production, the economy, uh, 3D printing, um, additive manufacturing and all that. That's only a short step. We, we, we will move into the biomolecular production. Um, an endless amount of meat without a single animal. You lose an arm in an accident, it will regrow. It's only a question of time because it doesn't violate the law of physics. So we have interesting views like Stephen Hawking who says the biggest threat to mankind is artificial intelligence. We have molecular biologists who say no, it's the mutation rate of microorganisms that it's the biggest threat because they undermine all immunization efforts. So let's look at computers. Computers are, as we build them today and program them today, are instruction executing machines. We write instructions and they do it. They do it wonderfully, beautifully, reliably. But they do what we tell them, even if they learn, we told them to learn a little bit as we learn. But what is it exactly that they do differently? Interesting enough, so far they do things very fast. Um, there is a competition in supercomputers um, every year, and three times in a row China won. We are now at, or last year, at 93 quadrillion operations per second. It's pretty fast. Actually, it's nothing if we move into quantum computer, but what it means, in other words, is um, computing capability will not be the limiting factor. Uh, but the question is, what is it that you, you want to calculate? Actually, the computers cannot do math very well, that may come as a surprise, but if I ask any of you what is three plus five, five, you will immediately say it's eight. The computer can't say that. The computer has to do if this, then that, if this, then that, if this, then that, and does it incredibly fast. But it's that, is it what it does? So computers do many things better than human beings. They control complex production processes, perform dangerous tasks, all this is very useful, and we move on with the automatization and um, autonomous systems at some stage. We start with that uh, they repeat narrowly predefined um, actions, but they move, of course, beyond that. We have seen a film where these tiny little uh, flying taxis, they, of course, do sense and avoid and all that by themselves. Um, if it comes to 
uh, combat robots, we maintain the decision to kill or not to kill, but everything else could be done by the machine. The question is, if you enter a situation where all the issues at stake are predefined very well, it's comparatively easy. If you're a commander of a missile defense unit and the sensors tell you there's a ballistic missile approaching a, one of your cities, you better launch the interceptors. You are not calling for a cabinet meeting, right? You do and launch the interceptors. But all the situation is pretty clear. Now, if you're autonomous driving, and you are not the um, driver, you are the passenger, and you enter a dangerous accident situation, and uh, it's either you, 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 know, you drive over the kit and, that, or, and you survive, or you drive against the wall, the kit is safe, but you die. So how will the computer decide? At the moment, we have to decide. But if the computer decides, we'll probably say, well, Mr. Ma, you are now 59 years old, you have three adult kids, the uh, invoice for the medical doctors goes slowly up, we could use your retirement pension fund differently for other nice things. Here's a young guy, good genes, good intelligence, pays the whole life into insurances. Uh, don't we agree that this kid should survive? Well, even if I don't like it, I have probably to accept the overall situation. Why? Because if we move into automatic or autonomous driving, the likelihood that I enter into a deadly or probably very life-endangering situation is millions times lower than if people drive. So probably, statistically, I have to accept that no matter how I feel. But actually then, what is intelligence? We don't know. I think what we usually call intelligence is the result of an intelligence test. You do a test and the result we call intelligence. And intelligence, what is it actually? Does it do good things to us? Well, we think usually yes, but you know, lots of the people in the Third Reich in Germany were pretty intelligent, but they were very evil at the same time. So what is it exactly what we look at? Is it artificial intelligence or the use of intelligence by artificial organisms or machines? And what makes the difference? Well, artificial, what is artificial actually? Human beings do something, but we are very natural, I guess. And at the same time, we apply natural laws. So it is so artificial actually. Um, the other thing is of course that we have these emotions and if I, explain to my students a very rational, cold-blooded, so to speak, worldview, and they ask, well, Professor Mai, where are the emotions? And I say, oh, yes, good that you mentioned it, emotions. Um, hate, um, you know, perfidy, um, bestiality. No, 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 we mean uh, love, charity, and, and caretaking. I say, well, so you have distinguished with your brain these emotions and other emotions. So at the end of the day, it's about us deciding things and how we value things, and that is related to culture and all these things. So they start with the automatization and autonomous systems and have liability problems. Household robots in Japan, let's say, they take care of the household of elderly people. If somebody gets injured or perhaps even killed by a robot, what do we do? Do we put the robot into prison? Would probably make no much sense. Is it the software development? Is it the producer? Is it the guy who sold us the machine? Is it us who bought it? Is it us who switched it on? Who is actually, at the end of the day, liable? We have to discuss this very carefully as we enter into this game. Now, last remarks. Um, Ray Kurzweil, um, famous theorist of, um, of uh, artificial intelligence, um, had a nice article about 50 or perhaps 20 years ago and the title was, the computers will convince us that we are superfluous. Well, if we don't want to be superfluous, we have to think what our role is in nature. What is it that we can do better than computers? And it's not about that the human being at the end of the day should control the computers, because who is it? You want Mr. Hitler to be in control? Stalin or Pol Pot? No, only good people, but who's good? And who defines it? So it always comes back to us to our culture, to our value systems, our preferences, our priorities. And we shouldn't just educate our children at the universities to, come, to, to become computers in the sense of memorizing everything and to repeat it for the exams. We should encourage them to think out of the box, to challenge conventional wisdom, to be innovative in all these things. And that is what is, I think, now at the core and at the challenge, and we will see that China is likely to program autonomous systems differently than us because it's an interesting 
tension between collectivism and individualism. And all these issues are so key when it comes to artificial intelligence. Thank you.